Welcome to our Noonday Bible Study. We're going to open up with prayer and then we will pick up where we left off last week at Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number 8. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number 8. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us to come together in Bible study this day. Father, we miss the fellowship and we sure would love to continue to be together. But we're praying right now that you would put an end to COVID. All of it, Lord. The Delta variant, the Epsilon variant that is already starting to show up. Father, we're just asking in the name of Jesus that you would speak the word and all of this would just stop. But God, we know you have a purpose. We know you have a will. And our purpose, Lord, is not to dissuade you from your will, but to pray. Because, Father, the prayers of the righteous availeth much. And it is not our righteousness, but it is the righteousness of Christ that is imputed unto us. We ask now, Lord, that you bless us in our Bible study today. Help us, teach us, feed us your word, Lord that we might continue to wax stronger and stronger day by day. Change our hearts and our minds and help us, Lord God, to stay focused on you, not what all is going on with our brothers or with our sisters, not blaming someone, not chastising anyone either, but God, just giving you the glory and keeping our heart and our mind focused on you. For we know, God, you are coming back. And we want to be ready when you come. So we pray, make us ready in our hearts, in our spirit, in our soul, in our mind. Make us ready. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to switch the view now so that you can see me. Amen. And you probably can't see what I can see. If you see me glancing off to the right, I have a screen that always shows me what's going on with the video recordings and everything. So we're going to pick up at Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number eight for today. Last week, as we were talking and we were ending out there in verse number seven, we were talking about, well, we, I should say it this way. We brought up the question, how was Jesus able to do the things he has done and is still doing to this very day? And we had a good answer here to verse in verse number seven, for the Lord God will help me, therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be ashamed. God will help him. That was Christ's resolve in his heart. No matter what it was that he would face, he knew God would help him in everything that he did. Excuse me. Remember, he made it his purpose to do God's will. He only wanted to glorify the Father, and he wanted the Father to be glorified through him so that God in turn would be pleased with all that he has done. We have to have this same mindset that Christ had back then. We need that mindset for ourselves even to this day. When we purpose it in our heart to serve the Lord, when we purpose it in our heart to do his will for our lives, when we purpose it in his heart, in our heart, I mean, to help build his kingdom, when we purpose it in our heart to bring the word to the lost, to the unsaved, to be a witness for him, to be a disciple of Christ, we are speaking volumes of what it is that we intend to do. And yet we have to know that we have to rely on him, that he will help us especially in our greatest times of need. But we cannot slack off from our dependency on him for help when things just seem to be going great. When things are going great, oftentimes for the believer, that's the easiest time for the believer to trip up or to make a mistake. Because when things are going great, that believer might tend to feel, well, God, you know, this things are going well. I don't need you as much right now as I needed you when things were not going well. That's the time that the devil tries to trip us up, to throw something in that throws us off. That's the time we're most vulnerable. So we have to always maintain our dependency upon him. 
when things are going great, we need to lean even more on him than we do when things are not going great. And we know we call on him, we pray to him, we look for him when things are not going great. But what I'm saying is when things are going great, we need to do it even more so that we are that much more prepared should the devil ever tr arise and try to thwart our path, throw us off track, cause us to stumble and fall, lay some temptation out there before us, we have to be on our guard at all time. Because remember, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So none of us are above committing a sinful act. Amen. Now then, one of the things that was so key for us there in verse seven was he said, therefore, have I set my face like a flint. Jesus set himself resolutely, I said this last time, to not be daunted from his work of love by shame or suffering. Two of the greatest things, the greatest things we view as threats, the things that trigger the fear in us the most are being shamed as well as suffering. We don't like to suffer and we really don't like to be shamed or embarrassed. OK, so it's like saying it this way. Nobody wants to let their skeletons get out of the closet because we are embarrassed by things that we have done. We would rather people think good of us, but we have to understand what Christ is saying here. He's not going to be daunted from his work of love. His work is love from his work of love by shame or by suffering. We have to have that same mentality that we are not going to be daunted from serving him by shame nor by suffering. Have we done anything that is wrong in our lives? Of course, all of us have. So we have something in our lives, perhaps in our past or even maybe in the present that we could be ashamed of should it ever get out. The easiest thing to do is stop doing those things, but it always remains in the back of our mind. Oh God, you know, I used to do this. I pray no one ever finds out that I used to do this. We have to get beyond that and understand that that's not going to deter me from my work of love. Too often in the church, that's how the work in the church gets halted. That's how progress gets halted. We have to be sure in what it is that we're doing. And not only that, we cannot fear suffering. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Here is the Christian believer, saved, but they are working hard to improve their walk with Christ. They come upon the issue of tithing and they realize they have not been a tither. And they purpose it in their heart, I'm going to start tithing just like the Bible tells me to, as God has instructed me to, that I might receive the blessings he's pouring out of the windows of heaven. So I start tithing. Well, right away, what the devil wants to do is make it look like your tithing is causing you to suffer. So you start tithing and here comes a bill unexpected. Boom. And what do we do? The first thing we want to do is stop tithing, take that money and go towards the bill. And then we'll pick back up the tithing later. That's just what the devil wants you to do. Stop Stop following God. Stop making progress in him. Stop walking with him. He does not want your walk with God to improve. So he attacks. And when we start to suffer paying bills, how am I going to make it? I'm worried. Oh, my goodness. How am I going to eat? How am I going to keep the lights on? How am I going to keep a roof over my head? Keep paying your time. God said he would pour you out a blessing that there should not be room enough to receive it. Don't let suffering cause you to say, I can't do this because when I do it, I suffer and I don't like suffering. We have to walk through this and show the devil that God will take care of whatever it is he is able to help me to get through rough patches, blind patches, whatever it might be, however I refer to it. So God is very good about doing that. Let's look at verse number eight. Isaiah goes on and says, he is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near me. The believer, by virtue of his oneness with Christ, 
uses this same language. Now, I know some people say, I've never said that about myself, but listen at what Isaiah is saying, because he's talking about Christ. He is near that justifieth me. Who justifies us? Jesus Christ does. If he is near who justifies me, then who will contend with me? Who will bring charge against me to say that I am not justified? He defends me. He fights for me. The Lord fights my battles. I may not have the vocabulary to say to say things like they should be said. I may not have the knowledge to speak on things that should be said to confront whatever it is that the devil is trying to throw at me. But he who would contend with me must also contend with he who would justify me. And since Christ is my justifier, I have to know how it is that I'm justified in him. How are we justified by Christ? We're justified by his blood. His blood washes away all sin. We're justified by his death. His death paid the penalty for my sins. We're justified by his resurrection. When he arose from the grave, we arose with him because we are in him and he is in us. Just as he said, the Father is in me and I am in the Father, when we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead and we are born again, we are in Christ and Christ is in us just as the Father is in Christ and Christ is in the Father. So we are justified through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now then, he goes on to say, let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? I want you to think about this. Psalm 138 verse 8 says, the Lord will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. Whose mercy endures forever? God's mercy endures forever. They're new every morning. And we ought to be grateful for that, rejoicing in that, and thanking him every morning for his mercy that he has already showered upon us. If not for mercy, and remember our definition of mercy, mercy is when God does not give you what you really do deserve. For the things that we have done this day that did not honor God, that were sinful acts in his sight, wherein we disobeyed him or anything else that was contrary to his word, we ought to be condemned and we ought to be put to death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. But that debt was paid by Jesus Christ. And so we are, think of it this way, renewed every morning, just as the mercies are new, we receive new mercies. It's not that we get up with the intent of going out to commit sinful acts, to do sinful things, to disobey God, to fail to follow his word or to keep his commandments. But during the course of the day, the one thing the devil wants to do is trip us up. And it can happen in many different forms. I'm at work. Somebody says something. I'm stressed out with what I've got to do. My load is real heavy at this particular time. And I don't like what somebody just said to me about the work that I'm trying to get done and get done on time. And suddenly I snap. And I say something I shouldn't say. I snap back at a person. And I don't mean to react that way. It's just that I'm under the pressure. Everything. I'm feeling everything. I'm all in my feelings right now. And they said something about the work that I'm trying to do. And, oh, no, you don't. You know how we get. And all of a sudden, we just snap. That can happen to anybody. Believer or non-believer. It can happen to anybody. Okay, so we have to remember that he will perfect that which concerneth me. I'm not perfect yet. As long as we're here on this earth, we are not perfect yet. We are not perfect until we are changed and we appear and we are just like him. Then are we made perfect. But until that shall happen, guess what? I'm an imperfect being that will do, even though I strive to do perfect things, will do imperfect things. Remember, our best deeds are like a filthy rag before him. That doesn't mean give up trying. Continue to try, 
But if we are open to learn from our mistakes, then we can gain and learn to do better. Amen. But he said here in verse eight, let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come near me. To stand together. What are we standing together in? In judgment. To try whatever issue somebody would have against me. What that means is Christ stands with me. I'm not standing alone. Even though sometimes I may feel like, oh my God, it's just me. Where are you? He promised never to leave us nor to forsake us. And you can count that God will keep his promises. Christ will keep his promises. The Holy Spirit will keep his promises. They never fail. So we have that assurance with us. But he also mentioned something. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. That word adversary in this context literally means the who is the master of my cause. That is, who has real ground of accusation against me so that he can demand judgment to be given in his favor? Who is it that has some dirt on me, knows something about me? Now, let me tell you something, y'all. We all know people who know some dirt on us. I just use myself as an example. I'm the pastor of the church. Am I, was I qualified to be? No. Was I worthy to be? No then why did he choose me? That's the question I ask him. Why me? You know my faults. You know my failures. You know how I am. You know my weaknesses. You know my strength. You know everything there is to know about me. Why me? And sometimes when we look at ourselves, we're that way. Who has it? People who grew up with us, who knew us. When I go back home, remember when Jesus went to his own town? He was without honor there. People had a familiarity with him. And in, in preaching terms, we call it the offense of the familiar. I go home, and when I see people I grew up with on the, that lived on the street with me, friends that I played with, they look at me. They never look at me and say, hello, Pastor Henderson. Hello, Reverend Henderson. They look at me and they say, Billy. Where's the honor? Where's the title? Where's It's gone with them because they know me. They know me in a way that others do not know me. And you can sit down with those kinds of friends and y'all can remember this. Hey, man, remember that time? Da, 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 da. And we snuck in and stole this or we did this. So remember when we went and did this and it wasn't right things that we have done. And while we may say, man, you know, I want to confess that to God, ask his forgiveness for the things that I did. Whatever it might be, stealing, lying, cursing, swearing, cheating, whatever it might be that we did as kids. We confess those sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know what the word says, but we still want this little thing hanging over our head that makes us say, you know what? I'm afraid because they know things about me and I pray they never bring it up or say something about me where others can find out I would be ashamed, I would be embarrassed. And when we act that way, guess what we do? We draw back. We, we're not as forward for the Lord. We're not as boastful for the Lord. We will not stand as strong as we can for the Lord because we are fearful that somebody might say something. So Jesus, just like he said, a prophet is without honor in his own home. We are without any honor in our own homes. I go home, my mama, my daddy, they were living. Billy, do this, son, clean the kitchen. Son, take the trash out. Son, pick that paper up. Whatever it is, they tell me and they expect me to do it. I can't look at my mom and say, well, mama, I'm a pastor now. I can't do those kinds of things no more. I wouldn't be right here doing this recording for you right now if I had tried to answer my mama in that kind of a fashion. So you get the point that I'm trying to make here. Isaiah, um, let's move on to verse number nine. Isaiah says in verse number nine, behold, the Lord will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they all shall wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Look at his confidence and his assurance in making that statement. 
The question for you and I is why can't we have the same? Why can't we have the same confidence, the same assurance that the Lord God will help me and we don't have to fear whatever it is that we've done and we don't have to worry about admitting, yes, I've done those things, but I'm a new creature now. You know, for some of us, uh, you don't understand, Pastor, I've done some of those things since I've been a new creature. That's why 1 John 1 and 9 is there. It's not for the unbeliever. That verse is for the believer. If we confess with our mouth our sins, God is faithful and just forgive us our sins, cleanse from all unrighteousness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. So we have to understand what he is saying there. Oft times, it's because we have done things where we are to blame. So in other words, someone with knowledge could stand to condemn us. But he also speaks here and says, Lo, they shall wax old as a garment, a leading constituent of wealth in the East at that time was a change of raiment, which is always liable to the inroads of the moth. So in other words, what that tells us is that my outward appearance doesn't define who I really am. Why? Because my outward appearance can change. Just as a garment waxes old and my outward appearance can change, hopefully for the better that I'm a Christian, so the same it is with the garment they would put on me with their accusation or the blame that they would try to place on me. I hope that comes across clearly to you. So what Isaiah is saying here, the person that could, would condemn me what they could say will wax old as a garment, as a moth-eaten garment. As a moth destroys the garment and it is no more worthy to be called a garment, so goes away. It's like the affirmation, one of the greatest affirmations a Christian can have. I'll never forget the time that I went back home and I'm on the street. I walked up the street because I seen a lot of my friends that I grew up with. They were at home too. They're out there talking. So I walked down the street to talk with them and I had on a shirt and I, the shirt that I had on had a message on it that said, Jesus Christ is King and Lord of all. So when they saw it, they said, man, that shirt is right. So we started talking. And before long, they looked at me, they said, Billy, you've changed. That's one of the greatest compliments you can ever receive when that change is for the better. They were able to see that I was born again, not because of the way I dress. It wasn't even it didn't have to do with the shirt that I had on. It was my manner of speech, the way I carried myself, the way I conducted myself. I was not the same person that they once remembered. Therefore, what they remembered me as a child doing when we played together and did things together fades away like an old garment, okay? What happens to it? The moth, time has eaten it up. And when they see the change and they see the evidence, not that you give for trying to give it forth, but just letting Christ speak through you, they will say you have changed. And that's a fabulous comment that anyone can give. Listen to Isaiah 51 verse 6. Lift up your eyes to the heaven and look upon the earth beneath, for the heavens shall vanish away like smoke and the earth shall wax old like a garment. There it is again, old like a garment. And they that dwell therein shall die in like manner, but my salvation shall be forever and my righteousness shall not be abolished. So even though the earth shall wax old like a garment, we have the assurance that our salvation will be forever and our righteousness will never be abolished because our righteousness is the righteousness of Christ imputed unto us. Listen to Isaiah 51 and verse 8. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment and the worm shall eat them like wool, but my righteousness shall be forever and my salvation from generation to generation. When I am saved, here is my assurance of my salvation. It shall be from generation to generation. So for every generation that God permits me to live in the midst of my own generation, by God's grace, 
I was saved. By his mercy and his grace, I have been blessed to grow in him. Grow to the point that I no longer need the sincere milk of the word, but am able to handle the meat, weightier matters of the word, gain an understanding of them, and be able to then go out and share that understanding with those who may not have an understanding, a better witness for Christ, okay? Verse number 10, who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. What a beautiful gospel message right there. Just in that one verse. You could take that verse and preach that verse. And that's a gospel message right in that verse. Who, um, who is among you that feareth the Lord? Now, this is all about us putting our trust in God. Who does this 100% of the time without failure? You trust in God 100% of the time without failure. 100% trust, total commitment, everything, 100%. If we've ever done anything wrong on a job, we've stolen something, pens, papers, software, stapler, sharpener, taking something from work that they paid for, for for the business, but we wanted it at home, so we took it home with us, and we figured they'll never know who stole it anyway. And then that next day, somebody took, and they named the item, and all of a sudden, where's that 100% trust? And then you hear, oh, well, we have security cameras. We'll go back and review the footage. Now your heart is beating real, real fast, real, real fast. You didn't know they had cameras. What if they've got it on film? Oh my goodness, what will I do? 100% trust, 100% of the time without failure. Who does that? We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yet Jesus exhorts all the God, Jesus exhorts all the godly after his example to be like him. And if we're going to be like him, we can't pick and choose what things we want to be like him in and what things we don't. His call is for us to be like him in all things. Okay. Isaiah chapter 49 verses four and five told us this. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I've spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him through Israel, though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord and my God shall be my strength. That's commitment. That's 100% trust. No matter what it is that is out there, I'm trusting that he will do what he promised he would do for me. I'm telling you, it's not an easy thing to always do. Some days, no problem, but there'll be other days because there can't be an ounce of fear within us and God will chase that fear out of us. But the only way we know where we have to work at is God has to reveal in us those things that we fear so that we can go to work and oust the fear and put more trust in him, okay? Now, he goes on in that verse and he talks about who is among you that feareth the Lord that obeyeth the voice of his servant. OK, now when he, that verse speaks namely of the Messiah. OK, the godly honor the son even as they honor God the father. They honor the son even as they honor God the father. You cannot get by the son and just honor the Father without honoring the Son. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We honor His Word because the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth. Listen to John chapter 5, verse 23. Though all men should all men should honor the Son, I'm oh, sorry, 
that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. God gave us a gift. How can we honor God without honoring the gift that God gave to us? If you give a gift to someone and they despise the gift, how does that make you feel? Oh, they still honor you. But you don't feel like that no more. Why? Because I gave you a gift. It was from my heart and you have no respect for my gift. I don't want to go any further on that because I might be preaching on that for this coming Sunday. That's what's working in my head right now, okay? Why do you think mankind tries to barter with Jesus instead of just obeying him? Why do we try to barter? You know what, God, if you do this, I'll do this. God, if, God, if you pay these bills, I'll start tithing. God pays the bills and you don't start tithing. Why do we try to barter with him? We should never try to barter with God. Try, take it from someone who's tried it. Don't even think about trying it. You're going to lose big time. All right. He goes on and says that walketh in darkness. Now we know as children of the light, we're to walk in the light, not to walk in darkness. We used to walk in darkness, but we were called out of darkness and brought into his marvelous light. God never had a son who was not sometimes in the dark. Hear me again when I say that. God never had a son who was not sometimes in the dark, for even Christ, his only son, cried out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When the sins of the world were placed upon him, and God had to turn his back on his son because there is no fellowship between righteousness and unrighteousness. He was made unrighteousness for us. So Christ experienced what separation from God is like. Why do we say light? Because the Bible says God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. But separation from God is like being in the dark. So when that says that walketh in darkness and hath no light, listen, you cannot fear God and walk in the dark. I know some people say, you know, well, I'm afraid of him. That's not the kind of fear we're talking about here. The proper kind of fear causes you to do right by him. The wrong kind of fear causes us to stay in the dark and refuse to come out for fear of what may happen to us, our deeds being exposed. We think that it's going to be this giant billboard in the sky and we're going to be the star and everything on there is going to be every wrong thing that we have done. That's not who God is. God is not about embarrassing us. God is about saving us from our sins, the penalty of our sins. And he has gone to great lengths and depths of love to save us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Okay? So he says that walketh in darkness and hath no light, no splendor, no bright sunshine. For the servant of God is never holy without light. Holy, I don't mean H-O-L-Y, I mean W. H-O-L-L-Y. He is never holy without light. A godly man's way may be dark, but his end shall be peace and light. Why? Because he will perfect that. God says he will perfect that which he has begun in us. He will see it through to completion. We're just not finished yet. All of us are a work in progress. That's something that we have got to get in us within the church because the church hurts right now because of our lack of understanding of that. Somebody does something and we ride them into the ground. We talk about them behind their backs, some of us in their face, and we want them to hear that we, so-and-so said it was a shame what you did. And once our business is all out there, what do we typically do? 
you don't see our face in the church no more. And what do people in the church do? Child, they gone. They ain't coming here no more. Uh huh. They'd have been found out what they was doing. Well, what if God treated you that way? No. When you know that someone is caught in a trespass, the Bible says you who are spiritual, you who are supposed to be saved, you who think you are on your way to heaven are to restore such an one in a spirit of meekness. You don't go and rub it in their face what it is they've done. You don't go and ask questions to find out all the details about what it is that they've done so that you can go back and give everyone the, the 411 on what really happened. Dr. Bailey preached a sermon for us one Sunday titled Waste Baskets. And he said, don't be anyone's garbage can. Don't let people come bring their garbage and dump it in you. It won't be their garbage. It'll be somebody else's garbage. Child, let me tell you, I heard about what was going on with so-and-so. Hey, I know why so-and-so ain't been here. Let me tell you what I found out. That's them bringing the garbage to dump in you. You are not made to be a garbage can. You must, you must never let people dump garbage in you. Now, me as pastor of the church, nobody wants me to know nothing, so they don't tell me nothing. But then when they come and they say, you didn't know that? How can I know? If God don't tell me or somebody who knows don't tell me, how am I supposed to know? Well, they don't want to be known as a tattletale, so they ain't going to tell the pastor because then everybody going to call him a tattletale and they're going to get locked out of the gossip vine because nobody will come and tell them none of the gossip. They won't know what's going on in church and they got to be a part of that vine. Listen, you got to be a part of the true vine and the true vine has no gossip in it. So get out the gossip line and graft yourself into the true vine. Then... You won't hear all that stuff. You won't know that stuff is going on and you know what's going to happen to it. It'll wear away like an old garment. Okay? So, a godly man's way may be dark, but his end shall be peace and light. Now listen at this. A wicked man's way may be bright, but his end shall be utter darkness. I believe it was the whiners that sung that song, Millions Didn't Make It. And he's talking about people trying to go to heaven. I want y'all to think about this. Now, you know this is in, in the Bible because we have quoted it off times. Where people are going to say, Lord, when didn't we see you hungry and not feed you? When didn't we see you thirsty and not give you drink? When didn't we see you naked and not clothe you? And he will answer and say to them, as surely as you did not do it for the least of these, you did not do it for me. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I know you not. Now, who's he talking to there? Who's going to make that claim? Those are people who thought they were believers. And they're trying to tout their works. The problem is, you're not saved by works. You're saved by grace through faith. That's what the Bible tells us. You're saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves. So nobody boasts. It's the gift of God. And you have to accept that gift, knowing full well you did nothing to deserve it. You did nothing to earn it. It's God's love for you. So humble yourself Accept the gift. Open the gift. Accept what's inside. His son. Let his blood be upon you. Otherwise, you're going to be in church pretending. I sang in the choir. I worked on the mission board. I did this. I was a deacon. I was a trustee. I was, the, I was a preacher. Listen. Except your name be written in the Lamb's book of life, you shall in no way enter into the kingdom of heaven. The way to get your name written in the Lamb's book of life, go back and read Romans chapter 9, verse 10. No, Romans 10 and 9, I'm sorry. 
Romans 10 and 9. Go back and read that. Believe in the heart, confess with the mouth. Go back and read that. That's what you do to get saved, okay? Let's move on. Because that verse end by, ends by saying, let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God, okay? Just as Jesus did. That's all that really needs to be said. Do it just as Jesus did and it will be done, all right? Verse number 11, this is the last verse in chapter 50. Behold, all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that ye have kindled. This shall ye have of mine hand. Ye shall lie down in sorrow. Oh my goodness. Now this comes in contrast to verse number 10. Verse 10 said, who is it among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? You can't do all of that, walk in darkness and have no light. Because if you walk in darkness, have no light, you don't fear the Lord, you don't obey the voice of his servant. But he says, behold, all ye that kindle a fire, you start the fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks. You speak things to start the fire. Okay? So this is in contrast to the godly. The wicked in times of darkness, instead of trusting in God, they trust in themselves. They kindle a light for themselves to walk by. Listen to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse number nine. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Okay, young man, you know how we were when we were young. I go through that now with my kids now. Because daughter's 19, my son will be 25 this year. Guess what? You try to tell them something. They don't want to hear it. They think they know everything. We were once there. Let's not forget our teenage years and our early adult years. When we thought we had the world by the reins and we were controlling our lives and doing what we wanted to do, we held the reins and we steered the cart of our life and we went where we wanted to go and did what we wanted to do. That's what I'm talking about. Because as a parent, you look at it, you're trying to deal with it and you're sitting there saying, I'm so frustrated by this child. They, they, they show no respect. This isn't the child that I raised. Yes, it is. Guess what? You're reaping what you sowed. The same aggravation you gave to mom and dad you have children and they just kind of bring it right on back to you. And you have to remember, I was just like that. Now you know the other side of the coin. Because the side we were on when we were that age, we didn't see nothing wrong with what we were doing. We wanted mom and dad to back off. It's my life. I got this. Let me live it. Now you see what they were talking about. You're trying to tell your children. If you were blessed to have parents as good as mine, my mother prayed for me. My father was patient with me. And I thank God that I got saved while I was in college. I got saved. And God went to work on me changing my life then. Everything changed for me. I was no longer comfortable doing the things I used to do. The only comfort I found was in going to church and doing right by God. That was the comfort that came to me. My father's instruction became so clear for me at that point. And he would tell me, son, I've been where you're trying to go. Son, let me tell you what you do, because I've already done this. And you turn that ear to listen, to listen, not just to hear, but to listen to him. 
and really take in what he was saying. And you go out and you find out that what he said for you to do was the right thing to do. Sometimes it's hard to do. You need to go to that person and talk with them. But if I go, they're going to want to fight me. No, don't fight. You go talk. Well, what do I do if they haul off and hit me? Don't hit them back. Turn the other cheek. Oh, I'm not going to sit there and just let somebody beat me. You will never know what God will do until you do what God says do. Turn the other cheek and then watch what God will do. But what if he hits me in that one? Then can I get it? Turn the other cheek again. When God sees that you're putting your trust in him, when God sees that you are demonstrating your faith, manifesting it, he will be there. I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's his promise. You can trust in him 100% all the time. Okay? So, we have to be careful of all of that. The image of that is continued from verse 10. That darkness, that human devices for salvation are like the spark that goes out in an instant in darkness. We try to put forth our best. We put forth our knowledge. It's just a spark in the dark and it's out. When he's talking about sparks, we have to understand a spark is not a steady light. But blazing sparks will extinguish in just a moment. Remember the uh, things that we used to play with? Sparkle, sparkle, sparklers. Can't speak. The sparklers we used to play with on the 4th of July. You light it and all these little sparks go shooting off of it. And we twirl it around, twirl it around, swing it around with our hand and everything. Swing it, swing it, swing it. And just watch it. And it would seem to make this little light, trailing light pattern with the human eye as we moved it around real, real fast and did things with it. But what always happened to that sparkler? It always went out. And as it went out, the sparks got less and less and less. And when it finished, there'd be a glowing red wire that would slowly lose its light. And suddenly, there's no light coming from. What do you do? I got to go get another sparkler. That's how man-made thoughts, man-made ideals, man-made ideas of salvation, all of them will do. They might spark for a moment, but they're going to go out. There is one way of salvation, and that is Jesus Christ. There is no other way for salvation. But notice what else he tells us. He, he says here, Walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that ye have kindled. Now, this walk is not a command, but it's implying that as surely as they would walk in the light of their own, walk in the way of their own light and their own, uh, of the light of their own fire and of their sparks, try to get it right, just like it says it, just as surely as they would walk in that way, they're going to lie down in sorrow. Why? Because the light goes out. It is not the light of Christ. And when that light goes out, where will you get light from? The light of Christ burns within the believer. We have to let that light shine. The less they see of me, the more they can see of him. That's how that light can shine brighter. Let me. Remember what John said when Christ came? He must increase. I must decrease. John's light was for a moment. Because he had, of all the prophets, the most greatest prophecy spoken. He said, this is the son of God. No other prophet said that. They all prophesied of his coming, but none of them said this is, and he was right there. John got to say that, okay? And he knew, now your light must increase and the light that I have had as John must decrease. 
And John did not think, well, God, that's unfair. Why would you let my light shine so bright only to become less and less as I get older and, and see him increase and increase and increase? We are but for a season, but the light of Christ shines eternal. One day I must decrease. Somebody else, God will send. And they will take Morningstar in the direction that God wants them to go. Right now, we're in a bits of a transitional phase is what I would call it. What we're going to look like when we come out of this, some of it, I know, some of it, I don't know. Because I don't yet know how we're going to do this thing, how we're going to do that thing, how we're going to do this thing. Because the whole dynamic is changing. Now, when I say dynamic, dynamic means it's, it's always changing. But so much is changing now. What is worship going to look like after the pandemic? Are we going to go back to packed houses at the church? Or is the word now going to be going mainstream via the internet? This gospel shall be preached to all the world. You're starting to see what I'm talking about. God has blessed us at Morningstar that he has already positioned us. So I'm praising God right now that as a church, he has chosen us to be a part of that fulfillment of his word. There are churches right now scrambling to get to where we are. Now, I know you can say, well, it's just as simple as picking up my iPhone, going to Facebook and doing Facebook Live. I can hold my phone and I can go live like that. Yes, you can do that. But let me tell you something. When people go and look for a church, do they look for a church where the windows are shattered, there are holes in the floor, the pews are missing the stuffing, there are holes in it, critters are running across the floor, no air conditioning, the doors are barely hanging on the hinges. No, that's not the kind of church they're going to look for. They're looking for a church without spot, without blemish. It's not about the walls. It's not about the pews, the carpet on the floor, the doors. Do we have stained glass windows or don't we? It's not about those things. It's about the church without spot and without blemish. And right now, we have spots and we have blemishes. Whoever it is that keeps the rumor mill going is making spots and blemishes. Quell the rumors. Kill the rumor mill. Stop the rumor mill engine from running. Throw a wrench into the gears and make it break. If you don't pick up the rumors and go around, I heard, have y'all heard? That's the gears turning. Stop the gears from turning. All you have to do is tell them, hey, nah, uh I don't want to hear nothing about no rumors or anything like that about anybody. If, you, if, if you've heard something about somebody, you need to go to them between yourself and them alone. And if they tell you it ain't true, then just believe what they have said. If they're lying, God will deal with them. But stop the rumors. I've heard doozies. Some were true, some were not true. But nowhere in the Bible did I see where God told me to go chase rumors. He told me preach the gospel, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to preach the gospel, and that is it. So 
This ye shall have of mine hand, ye shall lie down in sorrow. All those that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with spark, that walk in the light of your own fire. I've watched God take folk home, and I don't want to see him take anyone else home. Now then, my time is just about up, so I'm going to end here, and we'll pick up at chapter 51 and verse 1 on next week. I have a timer over here running and showing me at 56 minutes now. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here rather than try to run right up to 60 minutes and end up running a little bit beyond. And we will pick up at chapter 51, verse number one for next Wednesday. Uh, please continue to pray for our church, pray for our church family, pray for everyone. And listen, do not speak bad of anyone you may have heard is not yet vaccinated. You cannot force anyone to get a vaccination. You just can't do it. Hopefully, hopefully, everyone will choose to get fully vaccinated. But we must do what we can to fight this thing. And I want to say this to the whole of the church. Even if everyone in Morningstar was vaccinated, I still, out of an abundance of caution, would have said, y'all, we're going to have to shut back down because the numbers are going up. They are getting too high. And I would rather, I would rather be safe than sorry. The word is not going to stop going out. I'm going to continue to teach. I'm going to continue to preach. I'm going to continue to do what I'm supposed to do. God willing, and I pray, I never, I don't, care for funerals. I don't want to see people die. But at the same time, I don't want to stand in the way of someone going home to be with the Lord. If he can put an end to their suffering here and they can go be in paradise, no more suffering, no more pain, no more sickness. I understand. But I love Morningstar members so much. I hate seeing them go, but I understand that we all must go. And listen, y'all, it could be my funeral that could be the next one. We just don't know. So let's learn to walk together in brotherly love, to pray for one another, to lift one another up, to build one another up. Stop our whining, stop our complaining, and let's work together. The harvest is ripe, but there are so few laborers. Come on and get busy in your church. But if it be the Lord's will, we will safely open up again when the numbers are down sufficiently. We'll open back up again. And again, I will say to us, worship should not be as it was before. When we say, I was glad when they said unto me, come, let us go into the house of the Lord. We ought to be shouting and praising God right then and there for his mercy and his grace because none of us deserve to be there. But we are all blessed to be there. Let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this message today. We pray these words will echo in our heart. Bless us to not be afraid, but don't let us walk in the light that we have created for ourselves. Let us walk in the true light of Christ by abasing ourselves, making ourselves nothing, and letting the light of Christ shine forth through us. It's not about we are saved by the good deeds that we do. The good deeds we do are the result of us being saved. And we give the glory, the honor, and the praise to our Father in heaven through his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, may your Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with us henceforth and forevermore. Bless Morning Star and all the members and households of Morning Star, both those near and far, that we might remain steadfast, unmovable in our faith and our determination to serve you. We ask these blessings in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Let everyone say amen. God bless your hearts. We'll see you next time. Amen.